SREB's Making Schools Work operates in a wide variety of schools. While our name suggests that we primarily serve states in the southern region, in reality we work in schools all across the country. Our staff works in schools in Middlebury, Vermont, which is a small town of less than 7,000, 90% of whom are Caucasian. We also work in Birmingham, Alabama, an urban population of over 200,000, 30% of whom live below the poverty line. And finally, we work in schools in towns like Lovington, New Mexico, a town of around 11,000, 65% of whom are Hispanic, and only 8% of whom uh, hold a bachelor's degree or higher. So with that in mind, consider this question. Would you expect to see bigger differences between students' school and classroom experiences for a student in the Bronx, New York, versus a student in Madison, South Dakota, or between two students within the same high school? Surprisingly, our recent research study showed that there was actually greater inequity between students within the same school than there was between students at two entirely different schools. And this was across 103 schools and over 7,800 student responses. So with this really crucial piece of information, we decided to dig a little bit deeper into this topic of inner school inequity to try to understand why are certain students having different experiences than their peers? And what we found is that unfortunately, this is not an isolated occurrence by any means. Testimonies from our SREB staff who are out in the field, as well as analyses of relevant research and data to this topic, uh, all told the same story. First, a few definitions. When we talk about equality, we're talking about treating students the same. When we talk about equity, we're talking about giving students what they need to be successful. Usually, when we think of inequity, we think of, we think of racial inequity. But there's also gender inequity, there is socioeconomic inequity, and there is academic inequity. Someone that is very well known in the field of inequity in education is Jeannie Oakes. Jeannie Oakes focused a lot of her early studies on tracking in schools. And all of us are familiar with tracking. It's when students are placed into high or lower level classes based on their academic performance. This often starts in elementary school and goes all the way through high school. Students in lower level classes, Jeannie Oakes concluded, have a different quality of experiences. Their experience as far as the quality of the instruction, as far as the classroom climate, the expectations are all very different for these students. What we're going to move to now is our own personal experiences with inequity with supporting research on the screen. So one example of academic inequity that I've noticed at some of our member schools is that uh, there are still a lot of cases where CT courses are primarily populated by lower performing students and higher performing students aren't really encouraged to take these courses. Now, this is changing very quickly and that's good, but even where higher performing students are encouraged to take CT courses, they're typically directed into courses like engineering or healthcare that lead to high demand, high wage careers, while lower performing students are uh, steered more into courses in agriculture and manufacturing. Nationwide, African American and Latino students are far more likely to be suspended from school than white students, and considerably less likely to be promoted to gifted and talented programs or advanced placement courses than white students with similar test scores. When I think back to my time in the classroom, I'm reminded that I too was guilty of biases that impacted my work. In my school, like many others, poverty and race were determinants of the learning experiences students received. Students were commonly identified for special services based on poverty, race, and gender, and that in turn impacted their educational trajectories. 
When I was in high school, students who were within our AP and IB tracks had entirely different academic and career counseling experiences than their peers did. Our school had one counselor for the AP program, one for the IB program, and then one for all other students. And this meant that there was a student to counselor ratio of around 40 to 1 for AP and IB students. And for all other students, that ratio was around 450 to 1. So all of the students who were already our most likely to go to college were provided with the most guidance and the most resources in uh, selecting their classes, in applying to colleges, in researching scholarship opportunities, and thinking about their career paths. I was a teacher in a middle school for a number of years in North Carolina. We were located in a poor section of the county in an old mill town. There were eight middle schools in our county district. Some were located in wealthy sections of the county, some in middle class sections of the county, working class, and then we had areas of poverty. What we found was, because our school was small, we served a primarily white population of working class and poor students. What we found was that the, our school, because of its size, which was small, and because of our socioeconomic status, we received fewer resources, fewer funds, and fewer programming opportunities. Nancy Gutierrez, president of the New York City Leadership Academy, wrote that anti-bias efforts are painful, emotional, and complicated because they are about changing mindsets and behaviors. They're about realizing how deeply each of our backgrounds and life experiences color our perceptions of each other, particularly of those who have been historically marginalized, people of color, low-income families, immigrants, English language learners, and students with disabilities. They're about understanding how our perceptions shape our beliefs and our actions. Building equity in schools requires educators to reflect on how their perceptions have shaped their own beliefs and actions. Reflecting on our own biases is not easy, but is a necessary step in building equitable learning systems. So what does this mean? What can you as educators do to address issues of equity? Equity is very important to SRAB, and it's why we've designed our programs the way we have. We emphasize promoting high expectations for all students. Now, we understand there are some things happening in students' lives that we can't control, but we still believe that students will meet high expectations if they're communicated. Now, that's what we're doing to address this, and your response may look slightly different since you know best what's happening in your schools. That means you really have the power to do something about this. Every school from Vermont to New Mexico faces challenges that are specific to the community that they serve. Furthermore, this is a complicated issue, so it's important to focus on goals that are achievable and on factors that you can control. Now, maybe you're already taking steps to address equity in your school, and if so, that's great. I encourage you to keep it going and keep up the momentum. But if not, I hope that you'll find this a useful place to start. Thank you. So what are your questions that we have for our team? We've got three minutes. Come to the mic. As educators, we, we know that all of these issues exist. As we're preparing teachers to go into classrooms to educate students who are so dissimilar from their particular background and experience, how do you change the lens to try to develop what's needed to produce results in a classroom? I think one suggestion, and this is something that's fairly common, but I know in many communities what's done before school starts and it's been very effective is that open door between the community and the school and those visits to children's homes via school bus usually in the summer before school to begin, not only for your newer teachers but for your veteran teachers as well and that continue meeting parents where they feel comfortable, whether that's in the home, whether that's at a um, fast food restaurant, whether that's at a park, whatever. But it's, it's allowing teachers to 
know the community and be able to um, get to know the entire family. So that's one suggestion that I found to be very successful. We've used it in the past. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, sir. I have kind of a follow-up question. Uh, sure. I'm new to my school. Um, one of the first things I was told was that the demographics of our school has changed drastically in the last five to seven years, but we have a lot of teachers that have been there for 10, 15, 20 years. How do you change the lens of the teacher who has been teaching a certain way to a certain demographic to understand equity and how that impacts students when they haven't had to use that in the past? I mean, this is one suggestion and others can provide some more suggestions. One thing that we found to be, and, and this sometimes is in a professional learning team, is a book study. That's found to be very, very um, effective, and it's actually something we've done at SREB. So that's one suggestion that's been very helpful. The literature shows that providing students a voice to give feedback on the types of experiences they are receiving in their schools is a key way to get started. And then from there, you can start to have difficult conversations about what is really happening in schools and what types of outcomes are students having as a result of the climate that we have in place. These are very difficult conversations to have, and moving the needle in that regard can be very challenging. But then you have to really start to have some conversation about the mindsets of the adults that are providing instruction and leadership in the building and how that's impacting the mindsets of the students. Do they believe that they can achieve at a high level and are we providing them opportunities to demonstrate that?